Excuse me while I kiss this girl. Fairchild was the consultant on Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. That was the film you saw in the story there. It will be released next year to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Woodstock. Yeah, this is a shot of my credit for work on the film release of Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. Uh, I did a lot of work on that film. I uh, got a consulting credit. Um, I also wrote the booklets for the CD release of music of Jimmy at Woodstock and uh, did the liner notes for the video box that was released. I also wrote the screen legend that you see at the beginning of the film, um, the paragraphs rolling up the screen that describe the festival and Hendrix's appearance there. I did a lot of other work on that film over the course of a couple years. Uh, the incredible thing is that after the lawsuit, the people who now have my job and control the Hendrix company, they actually removed my name from the release of Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. It's just a fantastic thing you know, that I should have to explain this to people, that I did all this work and you can't see my name on there because there are these people up in Seattle that are like really jealous that I was able to get Hendrix's music of interest to like a mainstream audience. They can't do that anymore. Every release they put out just flops. It's just... Uh, of interest to a small crowd of collectors and guitar greasers and so they see fit to uh, sort of whitewash and right out of history all of the involvement I had that actually got Hendrix into the mainstream charts again and so instead they just like small-minded little children you know actually it's worse than that what they remind me of is the old Soviet style propaganda machine under Joseph Stalin or even uh, Joseph Goebbels under the Nazis the way they would rewrite history to suit their own fantasies, but um, the tragedy is that Rock Prophecy got caught up in their hatchet work, and um, it's going to have hor horrific consequences for the whole civilization. You know, these people up there are just banal, banal evil, just the brown shirts of, of art, as far as I'm concerned. Good evening, I'm Janet Lomax. A local man is responsible for a new investigation into the death of Jimi Hendrix. Coming up tonight at 11, find out how Michael Fairchild convinced Scott Lanyard to reopen the case. Hendrix died of a presumed drug overdose 23 years ago. Beat the Rochester man who has Scott Lanyard reopening the Jimi Hendrix case. Um, and you'll see why. Damn. The death of Jimi Hendrix was ruled an overdose 23 years ago. I'm Lynette Adams. This local man has Scott Lanyard reopening the case. Tell her. He's employed by Hendrix's estate to do things like write the 24-page booklets that accompany MCA's new Hendrix box set. A new traveling exhibit called Jimi Hendrix on the Road Again was actually Fairchild's idea. She was a tonight. 
She couldn't speak a sound and she wished she could. She stopped me. So she just kind of revived. She grew a real chill and she just wished it was short. She was like, she's not a real woman, you know. Kind of sight she'd ever seen her drop a stone. She's a baby, she's a passion now. Made of sand, slips into the sea. Yeah, several years ago, I was unemployed and you know running out of money pretty quick. And a friend of mine at that time, uh, he introduced me to a guy who was from one of this area's wealthy families. And uh, it wasn't long afterwards that this guy I was introduced to started asking to borrow money from me. He was promising to pay me back in a few days, and he just kept asking, seemed to be in need or something. So you know, finally, I gave him what money I had left, and and then I didn't hear from him. You know. So I went to the person who introduced us, and I asked where this guy was. And my friend took me over to the uh, Aloha Motel on Monroe Avenue, uh, where this guy was hosting an ongoing cocaine party. It had been going on for days. You know, coming from a wealthy family, he apparently didn't have to work, but um, the money he got from his parents wasn't enough to support his coke and marijuana habit, so he borrowed money for it from anyone who would lend it to him. You know, getting my money back was an ordeal. It took several months, and all the time I was out of work and broke, you know, so I was really struggling at that time. The thing that bothers me about that incident is that several years later, this guy goes and uses his family's money to run for government office in Rochester. And the people here, they elected him. You know, it's the type of person that uh, people in Rochester are trained by the media here to vote for. You know, someone who apparently never has to work a day in their life, you know, he had a serious drug addiction when I knew him, and the um, type of guy who goes and rips me off for money for months, you know, when I'm broken out of work, you know. The other thing is that recently the local media here, they keep hyping this guy and touting him as the candidate for the elected representative of this whole area. <laughs> you know, that's what Rochester is all about, you know, working class people trained by the dominators, you know. The media here, they suppress and silence anyone who calls for equality. Anybody who even mentions that word, they'll just be silenced by the media. You know, this place really needs to be boycotted. I mean, seriously, boycott Rochester. You know, it's like the Hendricks Exhibition. You know, here's a project that I originated at the Hendricks Company. It was my idea that I developed there for several years. It's a project that I designed to present Jimmy's prophecy. I, I envision that as a way to explain it, you know, and present that. And then Paul Allen and his money from Microsoft goes and destroys my chance to run the Hendricks company. And then the people who now run that company, um, they go and send the exhibition um, here to Rochester where I live. And the media comes out and they cover the Hendricks exhibition. But they conceal all information and all news about my involvement with this project. You know, like you'd expect you know, a local interest story, you know, somebody locally, it was their project, I organized it, developed it, and you'd think that the media would cover that, but no, it's just, it's like rock prophecy, they they won't mention a word about that, they just go and suppress to conceal all news about that, you know, for four years. You know, they've done things like that in the past, and all that's now the subject of another documentary that's being produced right now, but for me, it's just like a twilight zone situation it's a very surreal experience for me because um when i explain this to some people that this is happening they they don't make any awareness or any connection in their minds about how media is a way of controlling their thoughts you know they just have some feeling like they should accept this and tolerate it because they can't do anything about it and you know without realizing that it's media that's causing them to feel that way in the first place you know all for the benefit of some dominator who controls media and trains everybody here to go and chase inequality. 